You turn to the book of Matthew chapter 7. I'm in the NIV version. Chapter 7. Sunday, I thoroughly enjoyed Pastor Torrey's teaching. Thoroughly enjoyed his teaching. And typically, those of you that's been here, of course, know that we try to line the Wednesdays up. And so I want to spring off of his teaching. I uh, thought he did such a phenomenal job. And then as soon as I was tasked with the responsibility, I wanted to link in on his word. And he started talking to us about a stormproof life. And he told us right out of the gates that it doesn't mean that the storms don't come. It doesn't mean that. But what he does is we can be prepared for them. And the lesson was so thorough and so loaded with keys that we wanted to come right in and lay some more with his teaching so that we can continue building. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 30 is where we will read. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down. The streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teachings, because he taught as one who had authority, and not as their teachers of the law. At the top, it says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet, it did not fall because he had its, what, foundation on the rock. I want to talk with you for the next 40 minutes on a topic called living in a place where the storms don't matter. Living in a place where the storms don't matter. Father, thank you for this moment. May someone's ears be uncluttered and hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This text that we see in Matthew. This is the second time that you see an assembly of people, assembly of Jews, that are circled around the mountain. This happened in Exodus around Mount Sinai. Around Mount Sinai, God calls Moses to talk to him. Moses goes to the top of the mountain to talk to God, and God is talking to him. He's the God of fire. So in this particular moment in Exodus, the God of fire is having a conversation with Moses so that Moses could be the mouthpiece to the Jews, the children of Israel, the Hebrews. Interesting about that text is that the Hebrews are told, you can't come up the mountain. You have to stay at the base of the mountain. You can't even touch the mountain. They put a barricade 
around the mountain. If you read it, you remember it. So Moses is up top. He's communicating with God, and God is writing the what? Ten Commandments. I think we got the Ten Commandments. Let's put them on the screen. So he's writing the Ten Commandments, plain old school, what you should not do. I shall not this, I shall not that, I shall not this, I shall not that. All of this, I shall not, not including the other 600 and something laws that are going to have to be given later on. But he gives them these Ten Commandments. And while he's up there, all the people that are on the ground see is smoke and fire. They don't get to see God. Only Moses gets to see God. So Moses is having this conversation with God. God is talking to Moses. All Moses can hear is, is the fire of God and an instruction of God. And God's writing the Ten Commandments. Moses comes down. Moses gets mad. What does he do? Breaks them. He breaks the gift of God. He just left the presence of God, just came out of glory. Glory still on him. I mean, he looks glorious. He comes down, he hears and sees something that's not right, and he takes the gift of God, the message of God, the gift that God gave him to give to the people. The people made him so mad that he took the gift of God and he broke the gift of God on the people. What have you run into right after the presence of God that have caused you to break your gift, to lose your character, to be labeled something because you had a moment after the presence. In glory, giving God glory, and God puts his hand on something that nobody in the world will ever see. There's a special moment for you, a Kairos moment. And you come out of the moment, and you step into another moment where you allow the people to have that much power. They have enough power to pull him out of the presence and cause him to break what God gave him. Some of you are walking with broken gifts right now. Because you allowed somebody that has too much power, too much influence to shape your thought process right after coming out of the glory of God. And at this moment in your life, if you're going to be a builder, like what Pastor Tory taught us Sunday, then you can't have your atmosphere full of breakers. Builders and breakers don't work together. I don't need people in my company that are breakers when I'm trying to be a builder because your frustration is going to cause me to become frustrated and I'm not going to value what God just gave me personally. And you can get to a place to where you start shattering everything because your frustration has taken over the moment. You'll lose a spouse, you'll lose a friend, you'll lose a career because you came out of glory and was influenced by a breaker. Somebody say, I don't need no breakers in my life. He comes out, he comes down, he throws the tablets, he breaks the tablets. This is what God has given him. Now, if you pay attention to it, Moses is on the mountain. The people are at the bottom. The people cannot come up the mountain, nor is God coming down the mountain. The only way God comes down the mountain is unless Moses comes down the mountain with the gift that God gave him. Moses took the gift that God gave him, which was specifically for the people that God assigned him to, and he broke the gift. So he had to go right back up there and write it himself because he allowed people to have more power over the moment to frustrate him to the point to where the breaker became the better while he's trying to be a builder. Now watch it. This Old Testament 
is all about him trying to create the constitution for the church. He's trying to tell the church, this is who you are. This is who we are. This is my communication to you. This is my message to you because God's always interested in your being. Somebody say, my being, my being. He's trying to prepare you to be. He's trying to prepare you to become. He's trying to grow you. He's trying to grow your being. So he's giving him the message. He's giving him the message. This is the second time. Now, what's interesting in this particular text is that what we just read in Matthew is really something that Jesus is quoting from Deuteronomy. Because in Deuteronomy, they're on Mount Gerizim, and then there's another mountain I believe called Mount Ebal. And then there's this valley that runs in between the two. And while they're in between the two, the Levites are down in the valley. The tribes are broken up into six different phases, six on this side, six on this side. And if you remember in Deuteronomy, they would talk about bless going in, bless coming out. So when they would make those declarations, the other side of the mountain would have to say, amen. They would say, I'm blessed coming in, bless coming out. Amen. I'm blessed in the city and I'm blessed in the field. Amen. amen. I just wonder, do you have any amens in your life that when you make a declaration like that, I'm blessed coming in and I'm blessed coming out. I'm blessed in the city and I'm blessed in the field. If you don't have those people in your life that are ricocheting after you pronounce a blessing, then all you have is breakers that are surrounding you. And you'll never be able to build what God called you to build if you're surrounded by breakers. I wish I had a witness in here tonight. Look at somebody and ask them, are you a breaker? Oh, are you a blesser? So, this is what he's, this is what's happening. Now, when we come back to the New Testament and Jesus walks onto the scene in Matthew chapter 7, really would be chapter 5. When chapter 5 opens, Jesus opens with the Beatitudes, which are a resemblance of what happened at Mount Gerizim. And it is also a connection or the fulfillment of the law. Because we know that Jesus says, I didn't come to what? Abolish the law, but I came to what? To fulfill the law. So when Jesus steps on the hill, this is like the new Moses. But the difference of him stepping on the hill now is that there's no barricade at the bottom of the mountaintop. In the Old Testament, they couldn't touch the mountain. They couldn't even look up there. They couldn't even come up there. The only thing they could see was the smoke, and all they could see was the fire. But now there's a difference. Moses goes up in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, God comes on down. So in the Old Testament, we had the God of the fire. But in the New Testament, we got the God that's what? In flesh. So the God of flesh comes down in the New Testament. And the God of flesh comes down, he starts saying some stuff that don't sound right. Matthew chapter 5, who got it? Who got it? Read it loud. Blessed are the poor in what? Now, that's old school church. If y'all ain't never been to an old school Kojic church or, or church of the living God, do, do we have a microphone in here? Can I have a mic? Can I have a microphone? Just, I, I got one right here. Turn this one on for me. Yes. This is how they used to do Bible study when I was a kid. 
Now, you got to wait for my command. I got to tell you when to read. I used to like to see him do that. <laughs> Y'all remember that? Read! Testing. <laughs> for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so go back. Blessed what? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the, pure in, the poor in spirit. Read. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, wait a minute. This Old Testament is reading another kind of way, and then Jesus is coming down the hill talking a wholly different kind of way. He told my blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Read. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are they that mourn. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me it's a blessing to mourn? Read. For they shall be comforted. So they shall be what? Comforted. Comforted. Wait a minute. So God's coming with a whole new plan. And it sounds like God, because Moses ain't going up talking, God has come down reassuring. Oh, yes. Come on, read. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. The meek shall inherit the earth. Read. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Why? For they shall be filled. For they shall be. Listen to God. Come on, read. Blessed are they. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the what? Merciful. Come on. For they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the merciful, so they shall obtain mercy. Come on, keep reading. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. For they shall see God. Come on. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the who? Peacemakers. Not the peace breaker, peace but the peace who? Makers. And what else? For they shall be called the children of God. For they shall be called the children of God. Read. Blessed are they which are persecuted. Wait a for... minute. Wait a minute. What did you say? Blessed are they which are persecuted. Blessed are they who are Persecuted. Anybody been persecuted in here? Oh, yes. <laughs> Listen to what he says. Blessed are they who have been persecuted. Why? For righteousness sake. Read. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Keep reading. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you Wait a minute. Falsely. Wait a minute. That's what they, that's how they used to do it. Y'all remember that? Wait a minute. <laughs> read that again and read it slow. Come on. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. When men shall revile you. Read. And persecute you. And persecute you. And shall say all manner of evil. All manner, all kind of stuff about you. Read. Uh, against you falsely. Falsely. Sir, for my sake. For my sake. Jesus, read. Jesus, uh, rejoice. Rejoice. What? Hey, rejoice. See, I can't read stuff like that. I don't know how y'all sit still and read stuff like that. Because I have been persecuted. I have been spoken falsely of. So when I hear scriptures like that, it does something to my core because all God's trying to tell you is that I got your back. I got your back. That's what he's trying to tell you. And what he did was he left the fire and came in the flesh and reassured you himself. I'll come down and tell you myself. So if you've been persecuted, you're in line for a blessing. If you've been lied on, you're in line for a blessing. If you've been ridiculed, you're in line for a blessing. If they spoke all kind of mess about you, you're in line for a blessing. God's looking for you. God's searching for you. God wants you. Whew. My God. I felt something on that. I ain't going to even lie to you. I know it. it's Bible study, but that thing is in my core. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Was that verse 12? That was partial. We're finishing. My God. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so Wait a minute. What is your reward? 
But what is the door? It's great. Don't miss that word. Don't miss that. Because if you haven't experienced it yet, God's got it on reserve for you. You got a great reward coming. God's got something that he's been holding up that earth can't even handle. That I'm saving it for you because the natural can't take what I'm getting ready to drop on you. So some stuff I'm going to give you and some stuff I'm going to hold back because great is your reward. Somebody say greatness is coming after me. Read, is that it? For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So they, pros they persecuted huh. the people. You can get it for me. Thank you. Can y'all clap your hands so I read it tonight? You read that thing. My God, tonight. You read it like holiness. Can y'all give God a holy praise? So I took the time to do that because you need to know how blessed you are. Because people want to remind you of the persecution. They want to remind you of what you haven't done well. And that's what the Ten Commandments did. The law put you in the place to understand that you couldn't fulfill it. That you needed Jesus to live right. Or you would never be able to fulfill what the law was requiring from you. So God left the fire and came in the form of the flesh. And when he came in the flesh, all he was simply trying to tell you is you're blessed going in and you're blessed coming out. You blessed in the city and you blessed in the field. It doesn't matter what happened in your past. It doesn't matter what anybody has said about you. And it might have been true. But that ain't going to stop me from blessing you. Hey, somebody give him glory because he's the God of the just as well as he's the God of the unjust. Tell somebody he's God. Oh, yeah. Glory to God. Be seated. Be seated tonight. Somebody feel it like I feel it. Because, see, I had too many people tell me I wasn't going to be blessed. I had too many people that remembered my, own, my wrong better than I remembered it tried to tell me what they recalled that I used to do. But the more they kept recalling, God kept blessing. I wish I had a witness. It. The more stuff you kept bringing up, God kept forgiving me for it. The more times you tried to bury me, he raised me. Look at somebody and tell them that's the kind of God that I serve. If you believe it, give God the glory. Oh, my God. So when Jesus comes, this is the second scene of what we saw God do at Sinai. So Jesus comes with some connection to history because the Jews understand history. They understood what God did at the bottom of that mountain. Their whole life has been fashioned after that moment. From the Mosaic Law, the Pentateuch. They live their life from it. So Jesus comes and says, listen, I'm not coming to, to abolish anything. But I'm coming to fulfill it to make it easier for you. The text says that he taught with authority. You remember that part? So I had to look that up and understand it. You know, because we all want to walk in authority. And of course, that authority is the exousia power. You got the exousia, then you got the dynamos, the dynamite, dunamis, explosive power. Then you have the exousia, which is the authoritative power. So Jesus is teaching with authority. I figured that the scribes were teaching with authority as well. But what 
they were seeing in Jesus that they were not seeing in the scribes was an academic approach. Not that Jesus was an academic, but the scribes would always, if you've been to college, you have to cite your sources and always have to say that Robert Johnson said. Because academic to me, academia means that you're not in this thought alone. That somebody else sees what I see. So when they would talk about the law, they would run reference to what another scribe or elder priest would have said. Such and such and such said. Dr. Sabrina Ellis said. Dr. Johnson said. And then they would talk. Jesus didn't do that. <laughs> Jesus didn't do that. Jesus said, take up your bed and walk. Jesus said, give me a hand. Get up. Stretch forth your hand. That's what Jesus would say. Jesus would just touch the casket. Folks would get up. Jesus would walk out there with Lazarus and say, come forth. He called his name. They had never seen anybody that didn't have to use anybody else's name to verify what they were saying. So Jesus came on in the scene and said, I'm coming in the name of Jesus, in the name of my Father. And when you see me, you see they had never seen anything like that before. And that's what God's trying to do for you as you walk this earth. That you're walking in his name. And when you get to your job, because I ain't never seen nobody walk in authority like that before. I've never seen anybody speak to cancer and it leave. I've never seen anybody tell somebody to get out of a wheelchair and they got up. I've never seen somebody lay hands on the blind, on blind people and they started seeing. That's what he gave you. How do we know that to be true? Greater works shall you do. Are y'all here with me? So, this is Jesus teaching with this kind of authority. I say, therefore, me. He's not saying anybody else's name. He's, you pronouncing a blessing on us without saying somebody else? And you telling me that in this condition, I'm blessed? I'm being persecuted? What Jesus was trying to get them to see, your being matters. Your being. So when he was preaching to them, he was lifting their being. He was understanding who they were. Because if you don't understand who you be, you will never live up to what God says you can be. You won't even see yourself the way God sees you. So God has to step into your situation when you're broken and everybody has pronounced judgment on you and say, you're blessed in the city and you're blessed in the field and you don't even have a house and you've lost your car and you've lost your job and God said, you're blessed coming in and blessed going out. He's trying to get you to understand your being. Look at somebody and ask them, how you be? So he opens the book. Well, he didn't have no book. He was the book. He comes down the hill and there's a, a gap that has been closed now. In the Old Testament where the God of fire was at the top of the mountain and the people were at the base of the mountain. Jesus closes the gap and he walks down to the people. So he's just not God in flesh, but now God is tabernacling with the people. God is down there. So, so he's just not screaming from the mountaintop, you're blessed. He walked right up on him. I call you blessed. I call you blessed. It's a difference when there's a personal touch on it. So I want you to look at somebody, lay your hands on them and tell them, I said you're blessed. Tell them, remind them, I said you're blessed. I said you're blessed. I said you're blessed. I don't care how much money you got. I said you're blessed. I don't care how broke you are. I said you're blessed. I don't care how down you are. I said you're blessed. I don't care if your wife left you. I said you're blessed. I don't care if your husband left you. I said you're blessed. I don't care if you lost your job. I said you're blessed. I don't care if you've been to prison and won't nobody hire you. I still call you blessed. Where are the blessed people that in here tonight? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? 
I'm blessed. So he walks, he comes down to the people because he wants to inject himself into your being. Because God wants you to be, he wants you to be. Not just the idea, but the reality. Wouldn't it be something that you don't always have to say it in faith? I'm not saying I'm a faith man. Because once you get it, you don't need faith for it. So. Wouldn't it be something that all the stuff that you've been asking God for, that you don't have to keep claiming it in the name of Jesus, you, 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 you be it. I wish I had a witness here. You, 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 you be it. When you see me, you see it. You see it. You see it. And that's all God's trying to get you to see, that you're getting ready to walk in the season where you are what you've been proclaiming. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Do you know it? Do you believe it? Do you really get that, that that's who you are? So in order to do that, so in order to do that, the first level that we have to go to is the power of being. And the power of being starts at believing. It starts at hearing. Let me say it that way. The, the power of being starts at hearing. Faith come by hearing. And hearing by, all right, so fear comes by hearing. Judgmentalism comes by hearing. Being a racist comes by hearing. So hearing is important to God, or we wouldn't have heard him say in the text or seen him say in the text, he that hath an ear, let him what? What the what? Spirit has to say unto the church, and we are the church. So, so God's always talking. The question is, are we always listening? Are we trying to hear what God has to say? But let me tell you something. You will only hear on the level that you're healed. You can't hear beyond your healing. Because if you're not healed in a certain area, you will always hear it a certain way. And you'll process it different. You'll look at it different. And so you need to be healed in your heart, in your hearing, so that when God sends somebody to you, you don't run them off because your brokenness hurt at first. Because God will challenge you. And he'll challenge you in a way that will make you feel like he's disrespecting you. And if you're not healed, then when you hear it, he ain't talking to me. He talking to you. But he ain't talking. Who you talking to like that? Well, first of all, I didn't even say anything. What's, what's going on in you that's made you snap back on me like that because I'm trying to help you? But you don't want the help. You just want to stay hurt. And you want to be known for somebody that's a clap back. Don't mess with me because I'll get back on you. And all you're doing is running away all of the God-given help that God's trying to send you. You're too broken to hear anything. Faith comes by hearing. Okay? The power of being starts with hearing. Faith comes by hearing. Okay? I need to hear what the Spirit has to say. God will never sound like his word doesn't, if that makes sense. If you're not in the word enough that when God actually shows you something, you don't know it's God, okay? And so it's people like, how do I know it's God? How do I know it's my emotions? Get in the word, you'll be able to tell the difference. Because once you start getting in that word, you'll start understanding the culture of, the, of God. 
He may not, he may not sound like King James, thou art coming to see you. <laughs> He's not going to sound like the Message Bible. He's not going to sound like the NIV. But if you don't get in the Word, you're not going to understand the culture that God will sometimes do nasty stuff, nice stuff, stuff that I wasn't even anticipating. He'll ask me for awkward requests. He'll, do, he'll say stuff that just don't make sense, but it will make faith. May not make sense, but it will make faith. And if you don't get in the Bible to understand that, that when God actually sends somebody towards you, that ain't holy, that ain't God. Did you know God spit in a man's eyes? Did you know God asked a man that didn't have a hand to stretch out the hand? So if, if, if God, if somebody walks through and says, stretch out your hand, you know that ain't God because I ain't even got one. <laughs> you know that ain't God. I ain't even got no hand. Look at this. Do it look like I got a hand and he want me to stretch this out? Well, in the Bible, he did it. And when the man did it, are you hearing what I'm saying? So when you get in the Word of God and you start to understand the culture of God, this is the kind of stuff God would ask me to do. You mean to tell me, God, you're going to send somebody? I'm up here cooking my last. I've got nothing. I got me and my child. Me and my child. Mama, I know you're watching. My child and I. Uh, my, my child and my mama's an English. She don't play that. So my child and I, I'm, getting, I'm, I'm gathering sticks. And you sent a prophet. Yeah. It'd been different if it was you. It'd been different if I knew it was you, Jesus. Hey, I'm Jesus. But you sent a prophet. And the prophet got the nerve to say, hey, go on, make me that cake first. Let me eat that cake. God gonna bless you. What y'all gonna do? Psh, that ain't God. But if you don't read the words, you're not gonna understand the culture of God. That God will ask you for that. And then turn around and you go back and God meet your need. That he becomes the supplier of your need. But he wanted to know, would you trust him with your last? That's understanding the culture. So, 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 so the power of hearing it starts with, the power of being rather, starts with hearing. The hearing brings me knowledge. When I move from knowledge, if I don't do anything, the least I can say is I'm smart. But what does the Bible say about hearers? Can you grab James chapter 1? Do not merely what? And so what? You're going to deceive yourself if all you do is listen. I can't tell you how many people I know that can quote like a billion scriptures. Like I can only quote like six, like seriously. Like I'm a preacher. I just can't remember like that. And I got to stop saying I can't remember because the power of death and life is in the power of the tongue. And I'm supposed to say the memory of the just is blessed. That's what I'm supposed to say. But I'm having a real moment in front of you so I can show you. I, don't, I, I, don't, I just can't memorize. So I'll run up to my device and I'll scroll it and I'll find it and I'll read it to you. But I know people that can quote the whole book of Revelations. But don't live a dime of what it says. Put it back up there for us. What did it say? Oh, no, 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 don't, don't laugh at it. Read it. Look at what it said. Do Go to the next verse. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says Keep reading. And after looking at himself, 
goes away and immediately has amnesia. If all you're going to do is stay adhering, you are living a deceptive walk as a believer. That is why you don't know if it's God that's talking to you. That is why you can't explain how you hear from God. That is why you feel like you don't know if it's your emotions or if it's God. That is why you have to come to church and it has to be Bishop Jakes or you ain't listening to nobody. That is why. That is why. Because when you come, it don't even soak down in you enough for you to even remember who you are. You're this way in church, and then when you leave, you have completely forgotten that you love God. So the power of being keeps you from living a dual lifestyle. Go give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for he, F him. I can't believe I, I ain't going back over there. I ain't singing with them Negroes. What happened to the, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Oh, my, shy, my. You a run the OC in somebody. E my 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 co break hasty my tea, and as soon as they make you mad, that dualism is birth when you remain at listening, at hearing. So write this down. Doing is the difference maker. Doing is the difference maker. And we all live in this tension between hearing and doing. There are certain things that God tells us to do, to, 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 that he says to us, we can do. And then there's some things God tells us to do, and we're like, yo, hold on, God. When you find yourself in one of those seesaw moments, what you've given your ear to most is what's going to win. So if the word has become the priority, the word will win. But if your will has become priority, your will will win. That's in scripture for we saw Jesus in Gethsemane. Jesus did not want to die. He wanted to see if there's another way we can go through with this. So he had to go pray. He had to step into the culture. He had to step into the culture more than once. See that? Watch Jesus. He went back, and even those that were out there, they fell out. They fell asleep. The intercessors fell asleep on him because they will fall asleep on you. So Jesus goes back, gets back in the culture, wakes up, they're asleep, goes back, gets back in the culture, and then the culture wins because Jesus wakes up and he says, it's not my will, but your will be done. So you will all wrestle. You will all have the tension of, I heard you, but. And depending on where you're spending yourself, spending your time, that's going to be the deciding moment. If you are not in the word, and if you're not hearing enough word, and let's move to this, uh, I think it's the power of doing, it should be where we are, the power of doing, and that uh, doing is the difference maker, should be under your notes. If, if we're there, then add this, practice. The power I'm going to give you this. Write this down. You know, back in the days, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have run back up here. I would have just went to something else. But I got the greatest teacher in the world. And the greatest teacher in the world said, slow down. God gave it to you. Give it to us. 
let us have what he says. If it was important enough for him to give it to you, it's important enough for you to give it to us. <laughs> Write this down. Practice is the application. It's applied knowledge. And it's repeated activity. That's what practice is. Okay? It is, write it down, it is a prover of auditory reception. Okay? All that means is it's the ability, you have the ability to understand and not just repeat it vocally. Okay? It's a prover. Uh, being a football coach, we could be in the classroom all day telling you where to hit the two hole at or where to hit the six or what's going to happen, X, Y, Z. But when we put them on the field, in what? Practice. We put them in practice, and then we may move a linebacker in that gap. Or we may move a strong safety in that gap. Or move a safety over the top. Well, it all changes now. My responsibility has shifted. I don't know what to do. So this, 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 this is, practice is a prover that I not only just remember what you said, but I understand it. Let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me go even further. I started boxing this week. And uh, I've never been a boxing fan. I'm a football guy and a track guy. But I've gotten too old to play football. So I'm trying to find something that I can do. So I go work out with a friend of mine. And when we get there, the guy says, all right, you got good size. He said, all right, I'm going to teach you how to do this. Puts the stuff on. Get your stance right. He says, now, when I call this number out, this is what you do. This is a one. Pow. I said, okay. This is a two. Okay. This is a three. All right. This is a four. Boom. This is a five. It's a close uppercut. And he says, that's a six. Now, I'm not a boxer. Okay. So, while we're standing there practicing, he's like, one. I'm like, okay, cool. One. One, two, that's cool. One, two, three, four, five, five, six. Everything was cool. Until that joker said, two, four, six. One, one, three, four, five, six. Two, five, four, three. Three, two, two, one. And I was like, I turned into the matrix. I was like, what the heck is going on here? Practice. He put me in the... I thought I had failed miserably. Watch this. He said, come in the ring. Come in the ring. He put these things on. Well, you know, they hit you. Pop, pop, pop. And then, then you duck it. I don't even know the numbers. You already talking about slide, dip, and all of this stuff. I'm getting completely towed to pieces in there. I'm hitting, bow, pull it back. Because every time you swing, uh, somebody's coming back at you. Watch it. So here's what I did. I was like, shoot. He said, give me 10 burpees. I'm an athlete, so I'm okay with that. Coach, tell me what to do. I did it. So I did the 10 burpees. He walked back to me. He said, you know why I told you to do 10 burpees? I said, why? He said, because you're killing yourself. Somebody else is already trying to do that. Come on. Come on. Did you hear what I said? He says, you're killing yourself. Somebody else is already trying to do that. I said, okay. He said, every time I see you come down on yourself, you're going to do 10 burpees. So he was over there working with the other guy. I was like, God. He said, I saw it, 10 burpees. And I got upset. But God spoke to me clearly at that moment and helped me to understand that when we're building foundations, sometimes we build bad habits into them while God is blessing us. And so God will send people in your life to watch you when you mess up, to correct you from the beginning so you don't build condemnation into what you're trying to make happen. So he said, quit condemning yourself. You don't know what you're doing, and that's okay. 
okay. He said, in boxing, you will never arrive. Even the greatest of the greatest are still striving to be greater. So that freed me of being embarrassed about practicing. Because I got pride. I'm a ball player, and I know how to do certain things right, and you're not going to see me do it wrong publicly. But he broke that off of me. He says, you're not going to build a foundation that has the ingredient of condemnation. He says, you're killing yourself and somebody else is already trying to do that. I said, okay. So I kept on working, I kept on working and I was terrible. And I walked out of there saying, you know what? I had a great day. See, y'all laughing. But I would have been mad had he not told me not to condemn myself. So I walked out of there with a different expression on my face. I said, you know what? This is practice. At some point in time, the power of practice is going to be a prover of everything that I just learned. Every mistake, every fumble, every tear, everything that I lost is going to show up in my practice. Why are you swinging like that now? You don't know how many times I got hit. You don't know how many times I failed. You don't know how many times I lost it. You don't know how many times I felt embarrassed. That's why I swing the way I swing. That's the way I hit the way I hit because it took a whole lot for me to get where I am. So every time that you told yourself you were no good and every time you came down on yourself, I came in here tonight to tell you to break that bad habit and start telling yourself you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You are somebody. You are a winner. You're the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. And no matter what anybody has to say about it, your response is, today was a good day. Oh, I want you to look at somebody and tell them today was a good day. I don't care what happened. Practice it. Today, tell two people that right now, today was a good day. What's your name? Mimi. Mimi. Do me a favor. You see that man right there in that black jacket? In the black jacket. Right here. That's him? Mm -hmm. The glasses? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go change seats with him. Go change seats. Go take his seat. Change. change like, no, give him your seat. Give him my seat. Yeah, like, take your bags. <laughs> Go. Change seats with him. So, this practice is a prover. It's a prover. It's a prover that, that I got it. It's a prover that I understand. It's a prover that everything that uh, God taught me, I got it. That's what it is. Practice is the difference maker. If I don't practice, I end up deceiving myself. And when you're practicing, some people are going to say, thank you, how you doing? Some people are going to say, bless you. Some people are going to say, oh, you look stupid when you practice. Some people are like, why did you do that? That was dumb. Lady in the yellow, what's your name? Come back. <laughs> so, because you practiced, Come on. I'm going to give you $200. He said he'd give you a great reward. Did he not, did he not tell you that? Because you need the $200, don't you? Yeah, you need it. You need it so bad, I'm going to give you the rest. Here. Here. God told me you needed it. That's why I called you out. Because you're willing to practice. You see what practicing will do? Now give him glory. Glory to God. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. 
I said practice, practice praising him, practice lifting him up, practice giving him the glory, practice shouting hallelujah. You needed it, didn't you? You needed it, you needed it, you needed it, you needed it. I know you needed it. The Lord showed it to me. That's why I called it. Father, do it. Meet the need now in the mighty name of Jesus. May it be done. May it be done in the mighty name. That's it. I want you to let it go tonight, now, right now, right now, right now, right now, right now. There you go, right now, right now. Right now, somebody praise with her. Somebody give him glory. Somebody give him glory. Because you're in a storm right now. Yeah, you're in a storm right now. But I'm showing you how to live. It doesn't matter. The storm don't get the glory. Somebody give him glory in here. Weird stuff, that's the culture of God. God asks you to get up and move. For what? It's my seat. I didn't think she was going to do it. So I was going to go to somebody else. But God showed me that she needed it. The power of hearing the power of doing, doing is the what? Difference maker. Be a doer of the word. So, Lord have mercy. The being, he's talking about the beatitudes, your attitudes in you, I'm supposed to be. The doing. I need you to take the being because the being's going to fuel your doing. And once your doing is fueled by your being, you can be whatever you want to be. Watch this. When the word is foreign to you. Come on now. now hear me clearly. I'm not talking about you come to church and listen every Sunday. I said when the word is foreign to you, you don't have a habit of picking up the Bible. Yes. Somebody grab Mark 11, 23. Mark 11, 23. Let me get this mic. My, my holiness church. Who was that that was talking? I heard somebody say it. Come on. Mark 11, 23. Read it. For verily I say unto you, that whatsoever shall say. Wait a minute. What? Whatsoever. Go ahead. Shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be ye cast unto the sea. And shall not doubt in your heart, but shall believe that those things which he said which shall he come, what which he what which he said shall come to pass. When the word of God is foreign, mm. you will not say it because you don't believe what it says. And there are some things that are in the culture of God that is completely unbelievable until you have divested yourself, entrenched yourself into what the Word of God is saying. So once you get into the culture of the Word and you understand that God can do anything and that this power of being has gotten into your doing, then you'll start saying, that's my house. That's my car. My healing is all well. Cancer will not rule my body. COVID's not taking me out. I will not be bankrupt. This time next year, my money is changing. 
Why are you saying that? Because in between the power of being and the power of doing, what are you doing? The power of what? Practice. So you're not just confessing the word without doing the work. Because faith without works. Am I making any sense in here tonight? All right. It's 846. And that's late. So watch it. And I'm finished with it. But I got to say this because this is the whole scripture. He's talking about you taking this being, becoming the doing. So I don't deceive myself. So when I start building my foundation, I'm building on something serious. All of that that Pastor Tori talked about is the power of being. It's your job to practice it. It becomes the power of doing. I take the power of doing and I begin to build on the foundation. Now you've got two things that are looking at right here. We're looking at sand castles and solid rock. And you have to ask yourself, is your life built on sand castles? Or is your life built on solid rock? Sand castles are beautiful. And sand castles have to have a base in order to stand. Now, the interesting thing about building on the sand is this. When you study that history in Galilee and you study the water, the Bible talks about how the, uh, well, not the Bible, but, but studies show that the water would pull alluvial deposits. Alluvial deposits, that's the bottom of the sea. Rocks, dirt, the seabed, it pulls it to the shore over and over and over and over again. You've seen it before. It's just pulling, it's dragging stuff. I, I didn't really get that until I went to Africa, Cape Town, South Africa. Went to Cape Town, South Africa, and they took us to see Table Mountain. And when they took us to see T Table Mountain, the host said, this whole mountain was under the water. I said, what? He said, do you see all that, that grass, that's, that's, that's seabed? That's, that's, that came from the bottom of the ocean. The water pushed it up. Look at that. But there's no houses on that thing. Okay? We're not building houses on it. There are houses around it. Because it's good to look at, not good to build on. And part of the problem with us, we build on what looks good. Yeah. Oh, she look good. She could be a good wife. Oh, he look good. He could be a good husband. Oh, she got a good job. She'll make a good spouse. Oh, he got a great job. He can be a baby daddy to me. Oh, it, 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 it looks good. I think I'll move in that house because it looks good. I, I, th I think I'll go to that church because it looks good. I think I'll take this job because the salary looks good and we will build our lives on what looks good and what looks good is a sandcastle. Alluvial deposits, rocks and dirt that has been compressed by the waves constantly bringing it in and out, bringing it in and out. Now when you study this text, what it's telling you is that a person that is not from the area, they would come in and think that the alluvial deposits is good ground to build on. But Luke tells us that if you're going to dig for solid foundation, you've got to dig past what looks good. When Luke gives us this same scripture, Luke says he dug to have a foundation. You've got to dig beyond the appearance of things that look like it could hold you up. Some of the people in your life, the reason why they let you down is because they only looked like a friend. They only looked like a spouse. And you didn't do enough digging to find out if they was worth anything. So Luke says, dig 
Because the higher you go, the deeper your foundation is going to have to be. So we dig, we lay the solid foundation. And in my clothes, notice the storm hit both places. So just because you build on solid rock doesn't make you exempt from storms. I don't know why they told us. They told, they told me when I was a kid, when you give it over to him, turn it over to Jesus, everything going to be all right. I don't know why they told me that. Because the storms in my life didn't start raging until I said, until <laughs> I said yes. But notice the text. The storm hits both houses. So the solid rock does not make you exempt from the storm. But what the text does tell us is that the waves beat up against the house, the rain came down, and the rivers began to flood. That's three types of attacks. That's pressure that's coming upon you, down on you. That you feel like you're collapsing because of what you're going through. And then you got the waves that's constantly beating at you. That's the enemy that keeps tapping, tapping, tapping. You thought you got him, but he came back. You got him. He's tapping you. Keep beating on you, tapping on you. And then you have the flood, the things that's trying to overtake you. Three different types of attacks that happens at one time, and it happens in both places. The storm is not the main character in the text. The main character in the text is you. The main character in the text is the Word of God. Because if you built your life on the what? Power of being and the power of doing, that when the enemy comes up against you like a flood, the Spirit will do what? He will lift up a standard because you are built with the right stuff. And all I want you to do, and we're getting ready to close, is I want you to look at two or three people and tell them you're built with the right stuff. You're built with the right stuff. And I don't care what storm you're going through. I don't care how bad it feels. I don't care how rough it is. You are built with the right stuff. And I don't care how many times you get hit by tornadoes and by hurricanes. The debris will try to tell you that you're out of the will of God. But all I'm trying to tell you, the solid rock is telling you that you're built with the right stuff. Tell somebody I'm built with the right stuff. I'm built with the right stuff. I'm built with the right stuff. Right stuff. This is how you live. In a place where the storm don't matter. You can come, you can knock my house down. I'll build it back up again. I'm not a quitter. I'm a survivor. I'm a champion. And I'll rise every time I fall. I don't care what you say. I don't care how many times I fall down. I'll get back up again. I want you to take that hand and lift your neighbor up and tell your neighbor, get up off of your behind and get up on your feet and let hell know there's no weapon formed against you that's going to prosper. And regardless of the storm that you're going through, God's got a way that he can provide for you and protect you. Father, I thank you tonight for every person in this room who's going through a storm right now. And I want them to know that they have you inside. And the illustration about the storm is simply about them understanding that if they have the power to be, they got the power to do. And even if the storm tries to take them out, the power can be used to do it again. And in this season that we're in right now, we're going to let hell know that regardless of what you may have tried to take from me or have taken from me, the one thing you cannot take is my sanity. That I'm going to give God the glory. I'm going to bless the Lord at all times. It doesn't matter how bad the circumstance is. I'm going to praise you when I'm up. 
I'm going to praise you when I'm down. I'm going to bless you when I don't have it. I'm going to bless you when I do have it because my blessing is not predicated off you bringing me out of the storm. My blessing is predicated on who you are. And Father, we praise you and we give you glory for whatever storm we in. We coming out with our hands up. We coming out building. We coming out stronger. We coming out wiser. And we coming out prophetic. We gonna let hell know that this is not the end and that this is just the beginning. And I'm gonna do what the word says. I'm gonna rise. I wish I had a witness in here. This is not the end. This storm cannot take me out. I'm gonna live in a place where the storm does not matter and I give you praise and I give you glory in Jesus name if you believe what you pray come on clap your hands and give him glory in here